I just want to uh, thank you all for attending our last Entrepreneurship Live um, series event of the semester. Um, so my name is uh, Emmanuel Ibarra, for those of, of you who don't know me. And I'm the program manager for the Herb Kelleher Center for Entrepreneurship, Growth, and Renewal. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the center, um, the center is a resource organization that's focused on providing thought leadership in the areas of entrepreneurship, growth, and corporate renewal. The center also provides an avenue for academic and business collaborations for entities interested in um, advancing the management knowledge of entrepreneurship growth and renewal, such as Merrill Lynch and Bank of America. Our goal is to hopefully bring together university resources, leading entrepreneurs, innovative industry partners, students and faculty from multiple disciplines and multiple colleges to help and develop, communicate new knowledge about entrepreneurship and the entrepreneurial process, establish case studies and research in current entrepreneurship, develop and deliver outstanding programming like we're having here today, and to encourage and facilitate the development of successful entrepreneurs. Um, so if you guys want to find out more about our work, please make sure to check out our new website. And then also um, make sure to follow us on Twitter. Um, our handle is actually up there. Um, it's UT underscore Kelleher, C-N-T-R. Um, and then our hashtag for tonight is going to be HKC Live. Um, if you want to um, throw some tweets in there or ask some questions through Twitter, um, we can also take those as well. Um, and so without further ado, I'll go ahead and uh, introduce our moderator for this evening, which is our very own entrepreneur in residence, uh, Laura Kilcrease. Um, Laura, Laura has been around the UT Austin community for a long time. Um, she's the founder. <laughs> <laughs> and she's awesome. <laughs> Oh, that's good. Good save. Good save. <laughs> so uh, Laura is the founder and managing director of Triton Ventures, a venture capital fund investing in spin-out and early stage technology companies. She has more than 25 years of hands-on experience in commercializing technology. Uh, Ms. Kilcrease has a deep understanding of how to cultivate new opportunities to grow businesses around businesses, as well as how to deconstruct and reconstruct business models to achieve significant results. Um, she founded Triton Ventures in, in January of 1999 to provide management and operational leadership to emerging technology-based spin-out companies formed to acquire and commercialize technology developed by Fortune 500 companies and other large domestic and foreign corporations and universities and government or private research institutions. Um, that's okay, that's okay. That's enough. She's that's done. enough. I'm not that old. That's enough. <laughs> She's most often recognized for her outstanding achievements and has received numerous honors and awards, including the Ernest and Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award, the ABJ Profiles in Power Award, the UT Macomb School of Business Women in Business Leadership Conference, the Trailblazer Award, and recently one of the 30 most influential leaders in Austin over the last 30 years. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and uh, let Laura take it from here. Thank you, I don't need that if you don't mind. Thank you. Emmanuel's fabulous. Can you all hear us? I can feel it. Great. Well, we're going to have a really fun evening tonight. We have some fabulous guests who have uh, generously uh, agreed to share their time with us and have flown in from Denver. But you're going to see tonight that their, uh, their activities take them uh, many places in the world. Um, I'd like to introduce, first of all, Sue Thompson, to my far right. Sue. Um, has an extensive experience of both for-profit and not-for-profit organizations. For over 23 years, Sue's, Sue has been involved with two for-profit software companies, Columbine Systems and Antlis, where she held key management positions, including Vice President, Vice President of Sales and Marketing, Chief Financial Officer. She's also a principal in two real estate investment companies, Indigena LLC and L Laramie Ridge LLC. Since 2002, Sue has been actively involved in many no non-profit groups as an officer, board member, and general supporter. She has also served for several years as a committee member of a major grants giving foundation. Sue is currently on the board of Four Winds Interactive and the Boulder Kathmandu Sister City Project. She loves nature and is an outdoor enthusiast and animal lover. She is thrilled to bring to her broad-minded acuity in both for-profit and not for uh, profit organizations to her lifelong value of preserving lands and protecting the wild animals that live there. Sue also has a deep passion for dancing, and in fact, she, uh, she is uh, exceptionally good, I understand, in the Argentine tango, 
the teachers in Boulder, Colorado. Which, yeah, which wildlife tango kind of goes together. <laughs> great. Um, to my immediate right, we have uh, Dave Wiedner, who's also um, a strong history and leadership in the for-profit companies he's been involved with. Dave is a true entrepreneur who knows how to get make things happen. His legacy has been in the software industry, where he's founded two very successful software companies, um, Four, Winds, <coughs> excuse me, Four Winds Interactive, which was ranked in the top 50 list of Forbes most promising companies two years in a row, and Antalysis. Uh, as the second, as another company. Um, previous to his two companies, he was president of Columbine Systems. He is a principal in Indigena LLC and the Laramie Ridge LLC, which are real estate investment companies investing in land, residential, and commercial properties. He is now applying his business acumen to his lifelong passion for wildlife protection and conservation. Over the years, Dave's love of nature and the outdoors has led to numerous land acquisitions and subsequent conservation easement agreements which ensure the continued welfare of the land and its key habit habitats. Now with Wildlife Protection Solutions, which is the not-for-profit they have founded, um, he is able to bring his enterprising nature, high-tech background, and love of animals together uh, in service to wildlife conservation. I'm so happy to have these folks here tonight, but I'd like to also introduce two other uh, colleagues they have brought with them, um, who you're going to see more a little bit later. And directly here, if you don't mind waving, uh, we have uh, Rebecca Vanderveer. Oh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Rebecca has changed a lot since this morning. <laughs> and, um, and, we, and we have Eric Schmidt. <laughs> um, and please do join us, and I'll tell you about this later. Um, we have some surprises, some pleasant surprises for you in the reception later that both of these uh, wonderful people will be handling. So um, thanks for being here. Thanks oh. for having us. You're welcome. <laughs> tell, tell us about your business backgrounds and your, and your entrepreneurial endeavors. Sue and I have very similar backgrounds. We met right out of college at a uh, software <coughs> company that did commercial scheduling for broadcasting companies. <coughs> Parenthetically, we got married soon thereafter. <laughs> Uh, and that particular company was a, a great company. It was smallish when Sue and I started. When she started, maybe there were 10 people. When I started, maybe there were 20 people. And it ultimately grew to maybe 200 people. And the great thing about working there uh, as a job right out of college was we got to shift around from um, a lot of different departments, worked in a lot of different jobs, got opportunities to raise through the management structure. And, and as you mentioned, I ultimately became the president. Sue became the vice president of sales and marketing. And so that was just a great way to get started. And I think we're lucky we started you know, at a small company like that. But a uh, point came where we decided to go out on our own and start our own company. We knew we knew a lot of people with good technological backgrounds. so. Um, we took some of those people uh, and recruited them from just various, you know, interactions we'd had with them in the past and started a consulting company. And the consul consulting company was called Antalus, as you mentioned. And at that company, we uh, didn't raise venture capital, sort of interestingly. We just did projects based on the back of consulting. And eventually, we found a product that there was a pretty high demand for, and it was product configuration software for complex products. So computer companies such as Gateway were our clients at the time. So, you know, we spent, I guess, eight years building that company. Ultimately, it uh, was acquired by a, one of the top five ERP companies at the time. So they were doing it as a strategic investment. They invested in our Salesforce automation company, uh, really to round out their product line. And interestingly, as soon as they did, they had such a large client base, the product started to sell very well because they had such, you know, thousands of salespeople. So that was a good strategic move for them. And it provided us a liquidation opportunity. And at that point in our life, we found that we could retire. 
And we were pretty tired at that point. I'm so we awesome. did indeed take some time <laughs> off. <laughs> and what, what time frame was this? It's, it's in 96. We sold it in 96. 96. Yeah. And we spent, both spent about a year there and left in 97. Uh, so it was a tremendous opportunity for us. We got to travel around the world. And in traveling around the world, we tended to go to places that had uh, wildlife, um, places like Antarctica, the Amazon, Bering Sea. And you could see, uh, you know, what had been successful, for example, in Antarctica, a lot of the wildlife had come back because most of the whaling has stopped. So it was very rewarding to see that. Uh, in South Georgia, which is an island that Shackleton made famous, if you've read about Shackleton's adventure, adventures, there are 10,000 animals per square mile. So it's loaded with wildlife, and it's fun to see that type of thing. Uh, you know, when many places in, on the planet are uh, obviously having problems with endangered species. So anyway, seeing that made us, you know, in, in slightly different ways, uh, know that where our hearts were, were in the wildlife arena and preserving endangered species. When that happened, we also realized we didn't have near enough money to actually contribute to that. So we took slightly different courses back into the workforce, uh, Sue became kind of an expert in philanthropic organizations, sat on several boards. I don't know about expert, but. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm using the term, term loosely. World, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I went into the venture capital arena. You might have heard, heard of that. Yes, uh, yeah. just a little bit. Yeah, a little bit, <laughs> yeah. And that was a great experience for me because I got to see a number of different companies and see what their strengths and weaknesses were, what worked and didn't work. And I'd been fairly insulated really until then, just working at two companies. So that background was great. Uh, eventually I decided though it wasn't a way to make a lot of money and I decided to go back into starting my own companies. Um, one of my partners from Venture Capital joined me which was an incredibly talented young guy right out of school, but he did all the work for us, so I figured he'd be a good guy to start a company with. Right. <laughs> and we did that, and that is Four Winds Interactive that you mentioned. Uh, Four Winds Interactive essentially takes um, data from just about any source and displays it on a device of just about any type. So things like uh, mobile devices are obviously one of the display targets, but it can also display information on PCs and video walls. In fact, at the business school, there's a video wall that has um, a donor wall, donor information uh, on it, and that's software that we provide. We also do things like uh, provide the software that um, schedules events on advertising outdoor in Las Vegas, and indoors it does things like progressive slot machines. So all the indoor signage and most of the outdoor signage uh, in most of Las Vegas is done by our, our software system. So just to keep on with the journey then, uh, the, the guy that I was talking about that was great at running the company, he, we phased more and more out of it and he got uh, tremendously actively involved really from the beginning. But we turned things over to him and about three years ago, that gave us an opportunity to get into the wildlife conservation arena. So we took the, we thought our niche could be to provide technology that would help do conservation of wildlife. So we took the backbone of the software that we developed at Four Winds Interactive and tried to apply that to wildlife conservation. And the way that we did that uh, we took data from a source, as I was mentioning, and, and the source for us is cameras that are deployed in the field. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine ru ruggedized cameras that um, take pictures whenever something changes in their environment, like if an animal comes by, uh, sends that out over a network, which is kind of tricky because sometimes the network exists and sometimes it doesn't exist out in a jungle or bush environment. Uh, sends that out, and we have software that also 
uh, takes a close look at the images to try to figure out if animals or people are in the images and then sends that to a central source and a central source can be a device like this and I can for example check uh, what's going on in, at our ranch in South Africa and see who's just come in the gate and things like this right on this device. Same thing, it, it could be a computer, it could be a large video wall that is displaying this information and that enables us if there's a poaching incident or a problem with an animal or we're trying to recognize an animal it gives us the opportunity to do that uh, both in a local and a remote environment so so you've been very successful in business you're applying that success to um, WPS to the wildlife protection what lessons translated from your entrepreneurial successes into what you're doing in the wildlife not-for-profit arena? I guess I would say uh, we learn to lead from the front. Yeah. You know, because uh, what we're doing in our nonprofit now is we got land in South Africa. We even have rhino, something most people can't say is that they own rhino. <coughs> we built a campsite. And we are on the ground. We know what's happening out there. We know what the problems are. We're trying to you know, learn and fix and do it. And, and uh, so we're leading from the front. And we did that in our software as well. So you found the problem, researched it in your own manner, in this case, actually being on the ground in, in South Africa, right. and then went about producing a product to do something about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. And one of the keys was to debug that product because as you deploy camera systems, the operating system in a camera is, is not that sophisticated typically. So it might not transmit a picture because it's out of batteries or uh, obviously could have uh, in a similar way run out of solar power. Uh, it might not have enough telecommunication strength to send the picture. So. Debugging those things out in the field can be pretty tough. Yeah. My, my favorite is when the baboons get the cameras. Yeah, baboons <laughs> are a big problem. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe tell us more soon. <laughs> <laughs> Give us an example. <laughs> well, you know, those baboons, they like to see what's up there in the trees, and they just rip the cords, and, you know, they right. we learn what to deal with that. How do, you, how do you power something out in the middle of Africa? Well, as a matter of fact, Eric has created a solar powered battery pack to do just that. It can run your computer or it can run a camera and it's, you know, it's about well, this big and solar panel on the top and a big battery inside and that's what we found out was the key. Most cameras are, you know, powered by maybe 12 uh, AA batteries, let's say, and we've got more of an industrial strength battery in there to make sure that they can stay deployed for a long period of time. So, so if you would share with me a little bit more about um, the successes of translation of what you've learned in business for the not-for-profit, or perhaps some of the difficulties you've you've in, endured in trying to make that transition. Well, the difficulty, from my perspective, I was not used to fundraising to generate revenues for a company, and it's a completely different type of thing because you're not really selling something that's it's not that kind of even exchange I'll give you a product and you give me some money it's not that at all it's just the you give me some money part and we're doing it for a good reason I yeah. kind of like the give me some money yeah. oh, man, now that I, once I said it I <laughs> <laughs> well and I also want to say that um, less than 1% of all US giving is is to wildlife internationally so it makes it a little bit harder for us even to fundraise. Right, I can, I can imagine. Yeah. Well, and, and, and also you're fundraising for something that's actually not here today. That's right. It's right. in another yeah. continent, mm -hmm. which if, if perhaps people understand the need to preserve species, but they haven't been there, they feel it's perhaps someone else's issue to deal with. And clearly you don't think it's someone else's issue. You're actually no. taking this, this challenge on. Yes, that's one of the things once you get into um, 
trying to help with this problem, you realize there are really aren't that many people out in the field trying to deal with it. And that's partially because of the underfunded nature of, of working with endangered species. So if you don't mind me asking, how indeed have you raised resources for WPS? Well, we've been self-funded so far. Uh, we've been doing this for three years. And uh, we're now needing to move into getting more funding outside of us. So we've got some campaigns that we're starting up and working towards that. That's great. That's great. So when you started WPS, <coughs> the thing that stood out to me was uh, a choice of, at least at the beginning, rhinos. Mm -hmm. Why rhinos? <laughs> Well, really two reasons. Uh, there are five species of rhinos, by the way, and two of them, the Sumatran rhino uh, is down to about 100 individuals left on the planet, and the Javan rhino is down to about 60 uh, rhinos left on the planet. So if you look at lists that say which species have the least number uh, left, um, and you look at odd toed ungulates, of which they're uh, within that group, um, those are the top two that come up. So they are the most endangered odd toed ungulates. So that's sort of reason number one. Reason number two is they are um, unmercifully poached in South Africa. The, the horn is worth about a quarter of a million dollars. One horn. One horn, yeah. And so that means the people that are, are uh, trying to poach them are very serious about it. So we, f we felt like if we could stop rhino poaching, or at least help prevent rhino poaching, that we would get a lot of good spinoff effects from that in identification of animals and also stopping other types of poaching, like bushmeat poaching and elephant poaching for <coughs> the tusks. In fact, if you, if you can do that, you actually could probably apply that product elsewhere. Yeah. Well, exactly. You know, so we started with rhinos really to get our feet wet. We thought this was the crux of the problem right now. But definitely what we've come up with can work for any wildlife, any species, or any asset that you want to protect and watch or locate. So that's, that, that's, that would be quite useful. We have a number of ranches. In Texas, I'm sure, who could use that. Um, I'm going to shift a little bit. I'm going to say, ask a question about you both working together. Oh. Mm -hmm. 24 yeah. hours a day is kind yeah. of yeah. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> for profit, not for profit. Yeah. Well, how does, how does know, that work? You know, it's actually worked really well because we have different skill sets. Okay. Dave is the, the macro big thinker person, and I'm more the micro person, <laughs> the detail, the organizer, the implementer. So he's got the, you know, he goes out and researches and thinks it through, and, and I help to carry on at the, the other end. And make it happen. So, so has it always been like that for you both, in your for-profit and the not-for-profit side of, of what you're doing today? Pretty much. Well, pretty yeah. much. The difference is that now we have Eric that is the, <laughs> the <laughs> micro <Yeah>. person. <laughs> hey, good <for> you, Eric. <laughs> but, but, you know, this is kind of unusual. Um, you know, so often in businesses, when, when partnerships are formed, um, and it doesn't matter who, who the two partners are, one of the challenges is you have all the strains of those learnings that you've had as you go mm -hmm. through. and. Frankly, it's one of the biggest causes of business to fail when partnerships break up. And you guys have been successfully uh, partnering together for a very long time. Yeah. So congratulations. Congratulations. If there's a lesson from the for-profit world that you particularly took into WPS, um, what would that be from each of you? Stumped and I should, while, while, you, yeah. while you say this, um, I should ask those of you who have questions, if you would start uh, migrating to the mics. We'll so soon be coming to questions after we've answered this. Anything? Yeah, it's, we've touched on it before, but I, I think it was the biggest lesson, and that is to you know, ha own our own rhinos, what Sue was calling leading from the front, 
and then install our software system around our own rhinos and the ranch. You know, that's a testing methodology in normal software companies. You might call it alpha or beta testing. And it was far trickier than we thought to actually get these cameras up and running, to get them to go across a network because the networks are largely non-existent. So sometimes we had to build our own network across some of these uh, um, nature reserves that we've installed. So I think it's just, it's just normal information system test, uh, test programs, but sort of on steroids. And I'm glad we did it with ourselves first, and that way it didn't potentially damage our reputation when we went out to others, not knowing everything that we would need to know about how to keep your camera up, for example. You don't think about having a network in a four and a half thousand hectare, hectare ranch in South Africa. It's yeah. not the first thing I think about. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Some challenges. Sue, any other challenges? That you no, have? and I, I really couldn't think of anything. I was really just thinking, before you release it, really test it, yeah. you know, and that was true for software, too. And can I ask you both, um, and then I will go to more questions, the, the question. How did you get your first rhino? <laughs> <laughs> well, we uh, had a contact. Sue developed a contact um, that was a well-known professor in South Africa, and he introduced us to a lot of owners of rhinos. So he drove us around and introduced us to people and then we found someone that would both sell us the rhinos and lease us a ranch. And so we kind of got a package deal there and it was really great because we didn't have to move the rhinos. That's, that's fabulous. We have a question. Um, here first and then I'll come back. This gentleman's hand here. Was it, was it first? Quite a while. Please. Yeah. You mentioned my turn the job in rhinos been the most endangered, right? Why South Africa? Well, we knew that we um, were novices in the field when we first got into it. And there are, because there are 20,000 white rhinos, you can frankly afford to make a few mistakes. And Plus, there's private ownership of rhinos, as we mentioned, in South Africa. So it's so much easier to get your own rhinos, figure out your own system, and by the way, um, hopefully help with the poaching situation. And then, as we've moved into um, Sumatra, then we know a lot more about what we're doing. Um, there have been attempts in the past to, for example, import Sumatran rhinos into the United States. And, hasn't worked out well, and I think that part of, it, uh, part of that could be because uh, they weren't experienced enough to know some of the problems you could get into. So I'm surprised there's a hundred yeah. There's no habitat for them. There's no place I can see you Well, you know, now that you mention it, what, what we haven't said is we do have a research camp over in Sumatra as well that we helped to build. It's fairly new, and the purpose for the cameras over there will be actually to locate the rhinos, because there's so few, and they haven't really seen how many they have out in the wild. They are, by the way, thought to be in three parks in Sumatra. The park we work in is Lesur, and since they are in three isolated pockets, call it 30, 30, and 30, rhinos in each park, uh, there's a, some chance that they're going to need to be translocated to prevent um, genetic inbreeding. So the cameras do a lot more than just protect, but search and find and so right. forth. Hi. Um, good afternoon. My name's Kay Killen. Welcome. Um, I was curious when you were talking about fundraising, have you uh, implemented or used your technology um, in the social venues and other, in other ways of outreach um, specifically to benefit and fund your uh, project. And also I wanted to ask, um, are you going, is this being presented as a model of how to do this in other places? You kind of touched on that at the beginning, but uh, for people that may 
have other ideas of preservation, wildlife preservation, would they then be able to, you know, um, follow your steps? Uh, so uh, by social, do you mean things like crowdfunding or putting things on Right. Well, you're talking about some new technology here that you're implementing with the camera and what you do, you know, and sending the technology out. And I would think that you would somehow use that or, or uh, take it a step further, new technology, and present it as uh, an outreach of funding using social medias, yeah. whatever's available. And New technology. We, we, we have, to a uh, certain extent, uh, tried the crowdfunding um, uh, method, and that has worked with some success, but it's not at the scale that we need it to be to actually make a dent in a problem. <coughs> and we do do things like, you know, we are on Facebook, we've got a feed of Instagram, uh, that is all of the feeds from our cameras, so you can see some interesting wildlife pictures. And, so, you know, we're, we're trying to use these media, but we are not expert enough at it at this point to actually have it, you know, contribute significantly to our funding. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is a little bit similar to that and kind of a two-part question. Um, do you, are, is your intention to be able to share this technology and or sell it um, and are you familiar with like the situation in Limpopo with the landowners and the rhino owners up there are just being devastated and begging for help? Yeah, well, many of those people in Limpopo are our neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, we, and we're definitely sharing it with them. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, our intention is not really to sell it within the rhino community. There are perhaps 400 rhino. Uh, owners and, and park, you know, the parks and ranchers and so forth in South Africa, and we have a number of funding models for that. But what we've done so far is just give them the system, and then if they like it, and we've had one rancher who, uh, or or nature park really, just find poachers with the system, and uh, he was able to uh, prevent a rhino poaching using our camera system. So what we've asked him to do, since we gave him the system to begin with, is to kind of pay that forward in a sense and see if he'll help fund some of the other ranchers around. And he was very receptive to that. He, I know even this week they were begging for help, APU aerials and yeah. thermal equipment and because they're just they're just being devastated. Yeah. And I want to add to that, you also have some drones. Mm -hmm. you're using to yeah. try and monitor the animals, yes? Yes, we, and the, the intent of the drones, of course a camera feed comes out of the drones, so in that sort of command center centralized system I was talking about, um, drone feeds would be a component of that. And of course drones are really great from one standpoint, which is they're mobile and they can do things like check <coughs> fences, they could even potentially pursue poachers. But like the camera system, there are a you know, number of technical snags. To take a simple example, we had our batteries melt once. <laughs> They're difficult to get into South Africa. There's um, uh, the uh, FAA equivalent, I'm trying to remember what they're called in South Africa, but whoever controls the flight of the planes has grounded drones for a significant period of time. And now it's, again, OK to fly them. So, you know, there's problems like that to keep drones from being sort of a major component of what we do now. Because you keep using new technologies to enhance what you have yes, to do. Exactly. We'll, be, we'll be getting back to drones yeah. now that the, it's been lifted in South Africa. Thank you. Sir. Hi, I'm Nash. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for coming in. Uh, my question is regarding IPOs. Uh, so this is slightly business related. So in the past 10 or 15 years, if you observe, the number of IPOs have really gone down. So why do you think the roadmap to IPOs have become so hard these days? Roadmap to our initial public offerings. Yeah, yeah. As entrepreneurs, um, I'm not sure whether you've been tracking that as much as you've been tracking the right <laughs> Sorry. But, but uh, perhaps um, I, I can only share with you that um, perhaps we can have a conversation about this later. But 
We're seeing interest in the public markets only in windows for certain types of technologies, and those windows seem to have been getting smaller. And therefore, the average company to get ready to go public takes over a year. And sometimes the window for the opening is not a year long. So hold that question at the reception. We'll talk about that further. Thank you. Now. Hi, my name is Carrie Renson. I'm at the LBJ School. Um, I'm not sure that microphone is yes, on. Yes. Uh, Carrie Renson at the LBJ School. Um, I had a quick question about if you had any plans about demand reduction in Southeast Asia and Asia abroad. Um, as you know, that wildlife trafficking is a two-pronged approach, whereas law enforcement and catching poachers and then the demand reduction side. Do you have any ideas for platforms in Asia, like um, Traffic's platform and then Freeland came out with an app as well? No, I, you know, we made a conscious decision to go more on the protection of the wildlife and finding wildlife, partially because so many people, I think, are involved. Uh, um, organizations like WildAid have really focused on the demand reduction I personally believe that will be successful. I think that's a great thing to do, and they have that specialty. It may take a while before you know, it really cranks through and, and is effective. One of the first things Eric and I did when we started this uh, organization was we got on Baidu and, and keyed in buy rhino horn, sell rhino horn, and you, you get so many things coming back from from NGOs that would tell you why not to do that, that pretty much impressed us that things were, at least to some degree, covered because a lot of people are working on it. So we would be interested in doing that, but unfortunately it's just kind of picking your battles and decide where you can best apply your technology. Thank you. My name is Pat, and um, thank you for being here. This is very interesting. Um, when I hear about the situation about elephants and rhinos, whether it's from you or read about it in newspapers or magazines or see something on TV, I'm just astounded that we're doing such a horrible, horrible thing to such beautiful, majestic animals, and I wish I could go out and do something. But I live here, and I have limited resources, and it occurs to me that one of the things I can do is work locally, and we have this horrible, United States agency, state, you know, national agency, the United States Department of Agriculture, that has a program to trap and kill wildlife. And here in Austin, they trap and kill coyotes, and we've been trying to get that stopped, and we haven't been able to. So as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about the coyotes here in Austin. We're trying to get the USDA to stop trapping them and, and doing these horrible things to them. And also, I recently read about the bears in Florida where they were just went out and hunted bears for a few days even though that's unnecessary and immoral and cruel. Um, is there any possibility that you would enter the nonprofit world locally in the United States, you know, in and around your environment and just make it affordable for groups, small groups in the United States trying to do something about this horrible thing to do, you know, oh, a local... We, we would definitely make it available in the United States. In, in fact, we didn't mention we, we deploy it in the United States currently. It's usually in a test environment. Sue and I own a ranch in Colorado, and that's where we do our testing. And in fact, you know, we found bears and things like that coming into our camera traps there. So yeah, any anything we could do to help with any species, we're not at all married to it being international species. Do you promote that? Do you tell us how to do that and how we could find out more information? Sure. Um, we will have information at the um, reception and pick up a card and we'll be in contact and love we to help talk, you with it. We can talk at the reception too. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. So, the title of your talk says Capitalism and then what is your revenue source? Revenue source on wildlife protection solutions? Yeah. As uh, Sue was saying, it's predominantly funded by her, and a little bit of me. 
And we do raise uh, some money. Our, our software company, Four Winds Interactive, uh, makes a significant contribution every month. And some people that work there do. And then we have a variety of contributors. But it's predominantly funded by Four Winds Interactive, Sue and myself at this point. So wildlife protection solutions doesn't actually have any internal source of revenue? Not currently, no. I think this is where we'd be appreciative to all of you as you think of new models to achieve this goal, new business models to achieve this goal, to please speak up either now or later at the reception. Uh, because I think we're all about new business models and what we're trying to do today, uh, to, whether it's in a for-profit or a not-for-profit setting, to, to achieve what we set out to do. So. Yes. Um, ditto to everyone else. Thank you so much for coming by. This has been really interesting. Um, kind of a similar question to what was just asked. Um, with so many endangered species and, and opportunities globally, how did you identify your, the ones in Indonesia and Africa? And then even looking forward from that, what do you think about growth? What does the next three and five years look like for Indonesia? For well, we identified Indonesia, like I was saying, partially because of the um, limited number of rhino species there. But besides that, Indonesia, of course, has got a number of other endangered species. Um, orangutans, of course, maybe leave the list. Um, they have tigers there, they have elephants there, there are tapers there, tapers are, are endangered also, so uh, there's, a, there's species of gibbon, I believe, that's, that's endangered, probably several species of monkey. So, you know, uh, that's the thing about Sumatra and Indonesia. They, they could be so loaded with compelling wildlife species, they could be like Africa, and if we can preserve the wildlife in Indonesia, then I think ultimately they could potentially build a tourist industry around it and be very strong. So that was one of the main reasons that Indonesia has so much wildlife and so much compelling wildlife. They almost have a big five of their own. And so that's part of the reason we went to Indonesia. And, and then what, what growth looks like? Do you expand in Indonesia and Africa or, or do you look for new destinations? Yeah. It's mainly expansion in Indonesia and Africa through the end of next year. And then after that, uh, we want to basically get as many cameras deployed throughout the world as possible. You might have heard that um, there's potentially a new species of taper that was discovered in Brazil. And they're not sure whether it's a juvenile of a Brazilian taper or whether it's a new species. So we would love to get into environments like that too. And if we found people interested and people willing to fund something like that, then we would definitely go that direction too. Awesome. Thank you. Seth? Oh, thank you for coming. My name is Harold Ullman, and I'm an novice at this. So I can only ask, based on association with other things. Do you have a component that is based on ecotourism and trying to partnership with the natives to help assist you in the approaching process or your process? And or do you have a model where you're gonna work with the South African government as part of like the convention center here getting support by bread and breakfast tax? to support at a percentage, to support your ongoing efforts. Those are the two things I've seen work for Bread and Breakfast Tax Force in Austin. <laughs> but the partnerships where they got the natives not to hunt because they showed them the value of ecotourism. Do you have that as part of your model? Well, um, on the second part of the question first, we do work with the South African government in a number of ways, particularly their provincial parks. And their provincial parks uh, tend to be underfunded. And so we have uh, donated equipment to them just to kind of get them up to some basic levels, like things like night vision goggles, camel packs, bulletproof vests, that will just give them good equipment in case they do encounter you know, a, a dangerous situation. We've also presented our system to Kruger and we hope to integrate ultimately with the system that they're developing in Kruger to uh, um, you know, try and prevent poaching in, in that park. So we're working with the government in that way. We're a lot further along with the provincial parks than we are with the national parks like Kruger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
<coughs> and then do we have a do we have an ecotourism model? We're starting to develop one, and uh, the the type of thing that it would be is uh, sort of a behind the scenes travel in South Africa where you get to be on a real ranch and see how they operate it, see how we protect rhinos, kind of get that kind of uh, behind the scenes. You'd be able to walk around through some of the territories, which is relatively rare. Most people get in the back of a uh, you know land cruiser or something for uh, protection, you know. And, and so we've, we've structured an ecotourism type of thing to hopefully help start to get a different kind of tourism coming to South Africa. And then if we if that's successful, uh, as we were mentioning, we've built a, built a camp in Indonesia. So we, we then might structure that same kind of ecotourism around uh, our camp in Indonesia. But you haven't yet launched it publicly. Not you? much. Yeah. So you're Not still, yet. you're getting the kinks out of that model too. Right, yes. right. So, so the message for you all, wait till they get the kinks out and then go. <laughs> yeah. I'll be there. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Dennis Passavoy, and um, I was intrigued by Laura's uh, question about uh, the business model. And as you were talking, I actually started wondering your commercial experience versus your social enterprise experience. So on the commercial side, we measure success of companies by looking at the various metrics, balance sheet, P&L, and so on. That's pretty easy and transferable across all industries. When you get to social enterprises, though, it's a whole different critter. And I'm curious, um, as you start to think about raising outside funds, have you given thought to um, if, if someone wanted to write you a check and they, they said, how are you going to spend this money? How do I know that my check's going to do good? Have you given thought to how you would measure outcomes what, what would an outcome measurement look like in, in your environment? Yes, uh, we, we have given that some thought. And this isn't exactly an outcome, but at least at the front end, it's the installation of cameras. And so we can have a metric around, um, and in fact, we've got one for next year. We're trying to get 800 cameras deployed. Six, 600 of them in Africa, 200 in Indonesia, to do the anti-poaching work in South Africa and the bio identification work in, um, in Indonesia. Now that's not exactly an outcome. Uh, the next layer for us that we're, you know, we're not really ready to address yet, but we want to move them from critically endangered to near, just endangered, let's say and then move them up the scale since they're all classified. And eventually, you know, get some of these species, hopefully, to be, um, you know, in the near threatened category or, or not threatened category. And, and could you create a line of dots between X number of deployed cameras equals X number of animals that come off the endangered list or, or somehow save a, I don't one think of these with critters. that single action that you could create a line of dots, but I think in, with support from other actions, like if, if you look at the Sumatran and Java and Rhino, for example, step one is to count them, and, then, and that's what the cameras would be for. Step two would be translocation. You need to move them from park to park to get the genetic diversity that's required. And at that point, hopefully they get to be on the upswing, and if the numbers start going trending up instead of trending down, then it would move from one category to the next. Good. I think we could also maybe um, count how many poaching attempts we caught. Or, or foiled. Yeah. 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 And we did just, I think we mentioned it before, but we did catch a poaching attempt. Uh, and on our camera system. And actually it was a volunteer uh, working for us who was in Colorado, saw the image come through on, on, on his phone and said, hey, I think this uh, game reserve over in South Africa is having a poacher there. We called over there and they missed it locally. And, uh, and so they sent out their patrol and they, they pursued the, the poachers. 
So that stopped a poaching from happening. Right. And I think we could track that. Good. Thank you very much. Hi, Claire Krebs. Uh, thank you guys for coming. I had a question kind of on that same topic. How would you go about implementing a camera system like this to prevent poaching? Let's say if you had another ranch, would the cameras be deployed on the outside, on the perimeter? How do you guys go about doing it? Well, one thing we do is a site assessment. So we go to a particular location, and we, along with their people that at the game reserve, they know their land, their, you know, their environment very well. So together we go out and we look for common entrance points, like bridges over uh, rivers, you know, so that would be a, a, a key spot. Or uh, watering holes or um, hot spots where rhinos tend to hang out. But we, we do the assessment to determine where cameras are needed. And so you're assessing for rhino entrances as well as people entrances? Is that what I'm hearing? We're looking for people entrances and then where rhinos hang out. So, for example, on your y'all's ranch, how many cameras do you guys have installed? Kind of about 25. And, and that covers about, you know, 4,000 hectares, 10,000 hectares. And is that the optimal number for y'all? I don't think so with the topology of our ranch. I think there will be many more cameras eventually. Um, but it's just like Sue was saying, you know, some ranches are relatively easy to guard because they know where entrance and exit points will be. Some ranches, you know, have things like uh, fence, fence boundaries so you can see if the fences were cut. And so, you know, if you look for hints like that, that actually happened on our ranch. We found a cut fence once. So if you can have fence patrols, that's a good supplement to things like camera systems. And uh, another question, so it, just to clarify, it sounds like you guys have an on-the-ground team that's monitoring the, the videos as they come in and that would go out and get poachers. Yeah, yes. okay. there, there's typically um, people at one of these uh, parks or ranches that um, does the initial monitoring and there's usually a security team of some sort, sometimes large, sometimes small, that they can be dispatched out to get them and then we have a backup since this is all going out through the internet in the end then we have backup volunteers in Colorado that uh, can look and double check and make sure that things were caught. We do have an advantage being in the United States in that we're um, nine hours I think at this point behind what's going on in South Africa so when they're asleep we're awake. That's great. Thank you very Thank you. much. So she was. Oh. Hi, my name is Divya. Um, I was uh, so after you uh, go and like pick your site of uh, where you're going to implement your technology. What is uh, one of your biggest challenges when you go and um, I guess Im to implement the tech your cameras? Well, I'll answer one. Answer <laughs> 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 another one. Um, you know, we can pick the locations of where the cameras go, but then it's getting the camera in the right spot, making sure it's kind of camouflaged, but not too camouflaged, we've got to have good direct picture. So, um, the, and then we have solar panels that run the, the cameras, the batteries, and, uh, you know, hiding everything so that they're not seen. So that, I guess that's how I would answer it. There's, there's that problem, and then there's the, the connection of how, you know, the, the network connection. What do they have on that particular game reserve? Do they have cellular connection? Or do we have to set up something else? It's more, that's trickier. And everything Sue mentioned is sort of a balancing. If baboons, for example, are, are on your uh, nature reserve, then um, it has to be more ruggedized when it's attached to whatever you're t attaching it to. And the more you ruggedize it, the less it's easy to camouflage it. Mm -hmm. The more power it needs, the less it's easy to camouflage it. So a lot of this is just sort of a balancing act depending on the situation and try to optimize the situation as best as you can given the factors that Sue talked about. Thank you. 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 Th
But as technology changes, there'll be other optimization in those areas. Better, so faster, It's not smaller. a standstill kind right. of problems. So did you run into any problems uh, with just using the, sol the solar panels? Like, you're talking a lot about trying to camouflage it, but also making it durable. Did you run into any problems um, with, like, solar panels with that? Yes, we did. Yeah, at first the solar, powers, uh, solar panels were unable to keep the batteries powered, and that's why Eric invented this solar panel battery pack type of thing. So, yeah, it's, it's, and the other thing that happens with solar panels, just like the cameras themselves, uh, baboons, for example, will take them and move them. They're, they're uh, not into green energy, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good response. Thank you very much okay, for asking the question, sir. And these will be the last two questions for the evening. Sir. So, my name is James Neuberger. Um, my question is, what is your unit cost per camera installation, and then are you currently more bringing that down or working on making the cameras more effective? Yeah, the unit cost right now is $1,500 per camera. That includes a lot of things, though. Um, maintenance for several years, um, including a battery pack, including um, antennae if, if they're required. Often there's network topology. We've got to put towers out if we're Instead of using a telecommunications network, if we're using our own networks, we're, we might be amplifying Wi-Fi or putting repeater stations in. Mm -hmm. So all of that network backbone gets that camera cost up to about 1500 And yeah, we're undertaking a pretty major development in terms of the camera itself. I mentioned that the operating systems on a lot of these cameras are very uh, embryonic. And so we want to put a computer chip on a camera, and then so much more of the processing can be done at the camera <clears throat> instead of sending it and then doing the processing. So we think that'll be uh, a pretty good breakthrough is to couple the, the camera uh, with the computer, have it do all the processing there, if it finds something that it thinks it's a threat, then send it up. And that way it wouldn't be sending as many pictures, for example. And then I have one follow-up question. It sounds like you're developing a lot of your own technology. Are you ever uh, thinking about maybe commercializing some of that to help fund this work? Yes. Yes, we are. We're, we're going to test market this battery pack and, and solar panel, and that might be a way to bring revenues into that. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. And the last question for this evening. Hey, Carl. I'm again. And it's been way too much time on late night TV. <clears throat> but when you mentioned that you had people cutting fences, one TV segment, and I was, the question is about native participation. I don't know if you have native participation, but in one TV episode, same situation, where they built a fence, they hired the local women to as fence walkers. It gave income for the economy, and they went home and taught people on the reservation the importance of it, so you had reservation participation, but you actually had a woman's fence walking uh, guard that was hired. Do you foresee this happening? Are there actual natives on your lands? And can you incorporate a partnership with the locals in support of the economy? Yes, there are natives uh, at every park uh, that I know of. Plus, there are certainly we have uh, plenty of staff members on our ranch, and they do some very similar functions to what you're talking about. Thank you. So please join me in uh, thanking our guest tonight. This is certainly an exceptional case of conscious capitalism, a successful entrepreneurship applied to the not-for-profit space. And further, before I ask you to join me, make sure you come over to the reception and share with us your ideas on new business models and how we're going to make this happen on a, a larger, grander scale that these entrepreneurs have already started. Again, please join me, Sue and Dave, for being here tonight from Denver, Colorado.